My name is Nicole Bakker, and I'm very glad that I can wel welcome you again for this conference. We're now with about uh, more than 70 participants, and I'm very glad everybody's joining again. Before we start, some technical information. Uh, first, uh, this conference will be recorded. So if you have a problem with that, you can put out your camera or change your name. Um, secondly, uh, if you have any questions during this conference, you can put them in the chat. And Eric Kopp will uh, moderate the chat as usual, so um, you will see them later on. Uh, third, um, if you want, you could rename your um, name in the, in the screen and put your country behind it just like some of the people are, have already done, so we can recognize you and all the other participants, where you're from and who you are. And last, if you have any technical problems, you can ask the help desk in the chat uh, for support. And now, um, for the start of this conference, we will go to John Cook, who is in the United Kingdom, and he and his team have prepared this afternoon and he will tell us probably more about the program and what to expect. So over to you, John. Well, thank you, Nicole, and a really warm welcome to Can Mills here in Dorset in the south of the UK. So we are guests of Michael and Oliver Stote. Can Mills is our largest working water mill uh, in the UK, and you're going to be learning more about Michael, his business, and the history of this mill a little bit later on. So there's a bit of background noise because behind me um, we have the water wheel which is working away. Uh, we have turned off some of the other machinery uh, just to enable us to have a good conversation. So I'm so pleased to welcome you on behalf of the committee that have been putting forward and preparing this program to uh, explore traditional milling, the craft of the miller in the UK. And we're literally going to go from the top almost to the bottom of the UK. So we're going to be going to Orkney, the Isles of Orkney, which are of Scotland. Um, we are going to be going to Wales to learn about Welsh grain. Um, we're then gonna be coming to England to explore two uh, different, quite distinct mills, uh, Wiccan Corn Mill, uh, run by a group of partners, uh, affectionately known as the Wiccan Republic. Uh, and Dave Pierce will be telling you more about the history of that partnership and how they work to maintain, to repair and also run uh, Wiccan Mill. And then right at the end of our conference, we'll be coming back to Can Mills where we'll be able to learn the fantastic history of this mill um, uh, and find out about how Michael is adapting and evolving the craft of the miller, incorporating modern machinery alongside uh, our traditional milling techniques. As Nicole has already said, um, we are going to be engaging with you. So there'll be lots of opportunities and we're really encouraging you to be taking a really active part by putting your questions in the chat, which Eric will pick up on and then we'll bring you in live, if that's okay with you, to ask your questions and engage with our presenters. Equally, at the end of our conference, we have a half an hour, a great time to network and to uh, share your experiences with other millers. So we hope you enjoy our uh, conference today. And so um, I'm gonna actually start by inviting my colleague Mildred Cookson, who is the chairman of the mill section of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, one of the two main organizations that work to protect and promote our traditional mills here in the UK. Mildred's going to tell us something about traditional milling uh, today in the UK. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mildred. Mildred. Everybody, and it's really good to be with everybody internationally. This meeting is from the UK, and uh, I'm hoping I can give you a, an overview of the craft of the miller here. The craft itself needs practical and theoretical knowledge. And from personal experience, I know these take time to learn. Getting to know your mill and all its movements. Okay. And there is an urgent need to pass on these skills to the next generation. Most mills are now working with fairly elderly people. There are some young people, fair enough, like John and uh, this gentleman here on the screen, but a lot of mills are run by volunteers which are quite in their retirement age or, or past. And, uh, it is a bit of a worry of what's going to happen next. 
<clears throat> in England, they we've got both commercial and volunteer millers, like I'm sure you all have. And together they form an important part of keeping this craft alive. But traditional mills need help and support. And in the UK, we have the traditional core millers guild and the SPAB mills section. We run courses such as maintenance matters, look, making people aware of how to do fairly, not, not easy tasks, but being able to strip the stones down and look after their mill, the dressing machine, their grain and things and know about that. And, um, and John also runs courses for us on practical milling, which is a great, um, a great thing to have. And millwrights have got to work alongside the miller and both depend on each other. And millwriting skills in the, in the UK are also <clears throat> at risk as well. Working with the Environment Agency on water issues is an important issue for water millers. And Natura, um, the water directive in Europe <clears throat> is also working towards um, ecological and keeping um, all the water, the water and the area around the things ecological so that um, it keeps it safe for the future. National Mills Weekend is the time when mills can open their doors and this works for not only the UK but also Germany and other European countries, the Netherlands, some of them on the same day as we have it in the UK as well. But it gives people chance to visit mills that they wouldn't normally see perhaps and see how they work and how important it's a part of a heritage this is for us all. <clears throat> and during the pandemic, both of us helped to promote traditional mills, both on social media and in the national press. They were very much overworked during the time of the uh, pandemic, um, but were very useful because supermarkets weren't able to supply flour. So traditional mills came into their own. Unfortunately, since then, it has now slowed down for most of these mills and people have gone back to supermarket buying, which is, which is a bit sad, really. But we're still trying to promote traditional mills to say the flour is much better getting it from that. And most of us need to work together to make sure we're putting in place now the ways of passing on our skills for the future. Well, I hope that's given you some kind of an overview of the UK. And I'm very happy to answer any questions if there are any. And um, thank you very much for listening. And I'll pass you back to John. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mildred, for that introduction, giving us a sense in terms of what's going on with you within the UK. And as Mildred's recognised, a, a, a mixed picture, some mills that have been able to take advantage of both the market um, and actively work uh, and produce both flour and other products, um, as we'll also recognize other mills uh, and mills that are in different stages of repair that actually need significant financial support. And perhaps that's one of the things that we might end up talking about in our questions a bit later on. So we're now going to move to the first of our core presentations after that really helpful introduction. And as I mentioned in my introduction, we're going north. We're going to the far north of Scotland, uh, to Barony Mill, uh, the only mill now in the UK which is producing a unique bear meal, uh, which is a meal which is produced uh, from a barley-like uh, grain. Um, I'll say no more because I'll be, uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, still in the thunder of uh, the great film that we're going to see to start with. And then uh, we're going to invite Ali Harkas to come and join us for some questions. So without further ado, let's go and have an introduction to the Barony Mill uh, with a video. Off we go, thank you. This is a pity video into the life of the Barony Mill. We will hear from young tour guide Ellen Hay and we will also see Margaret Phillips prepare a traditional bear bannock. So this is the Barney Mill and it is the last working water mill in Orkney. The mill was built in 1873 by a man called William Hepburn and he was the first miller. What we do here is we make bear meal flour and this is made from a grain called bear which is an ancient form of barley. It's thought to be about 5,000 years old. 
And in 1997, the Barsley Heritage Trust took on the mill and they've had it ever since. So up here on the top floor, we have the kiln, and this is where we dry all of our grain before we go on to milling. This is because Orkney is a very wet climate, so the grain needs to be really dry so we can mill it. It's up here for about five to six hours drying, and then we have to let it cool overnight to then go on to the milling process. Um, the, we have a fire that heats the kiln, and this is run by the husks that we take off of the grain, meaning that it's 100% sustainable. The grain is dropped down from the kiln here into the hoppers and it's bagged up and moved along to the millstones. This is assisted by the use of the central hoist throughout the mill, which is powered by the water wheel outside. Here we have our three milling stones. Our first one is called the shilling stone and this is what scrapes the husk off of the grain. Over here we have our oatmeal stone and this is what grinds down the grain into what we call grab. It then moves on to the final stone which is called the bear meal stone and this grinds our grab down into our fine bear meal flour. On each set we have two stones so the bottom one is fixed and the top one rotates round to grind the grain. Outside we have our water wheel and this runs at 12 revolutions per minute. The gears then drive this up to make the stones go 10 times faster at 120 revolutions per minute. So here we have the main gearings of the mill with the central shaft of the water wheel entering below. This drives the spur wheel and the spur wheel has wooden teeth and this has been designed that if there's an emergency in the mill these teeth will break and the whole mill will stop. The spur wheel then has to drive everything upstairs to power the mill. Maybe even seven minutes each side. And uh, I think they're ready. So, cow, not white. So, that's the texture in the middle. It's uh, traditionally eaten with butter and cheese, but uh, can be jam. I even know somebody that eats Orkney honey on their bear bannock, so. That's the traditional fare, bear bannocks and cheese. Here we can see a field of bear being harvested across from the Barney Mill in Bushy. Bear is the ancient variation of barley and grows in four to six rows in comparison with modern day barley which grows in two rows. Bear, whilst being 50% less yield, grows very well in Orkney as it is tolerant of the cool and wet climate and is often referred to as the 90 day yield. A mill has stood on this site since the age of the Vikings. The modern day mill was built in 1873 and it fell into disrepair in the late 90s. This spurred on the Bushy community to come together and establish the Bushy Heritage Trust and over the period of a few years lovingly restored the mill back into working condition and it has been operated by the Trust ever since which is made up of local volunteers. The Barney Mill is open for visitors during the summer months, with milling taking place over the winter months. With every year, the mill is going from strength to strength with increased demand and interest. And if you would like to find more about our work, please visit our brand new website, barneymill.com. Well. Thank you very much indeed to the team at Barony Mill for sharing that really fascinating insight into both the mill, but equally uh, how, uh, you know, in a local area, um, the mill and indeed uh, the milling has adapted to the climate, which is going to be a theme that we pick up uh, in the presentation, which comes next. But before we go any, uh, towards that, uh, it's time for some questions uh, from you. 
And this is where um, I introduce my colleague, Eric Kopp, who is uh, in the studio in uh, the Netherlands. And uh, here we go, here's Eric, you probably see on your screen now. And Eric has been capturing questions that have been coming up in the chat. So Eric, um, do we have any questions uh, already for uh, Ali uh, and for the Bursi uh, Heritage team? Well, right now the, the participants are a bit reluctant to uh, juice the chat. So uh, maybe uh, there is a, uh, a wall to, uh, to climb, but I have uh, two, uh, two questions. Um, first Where? of all, I, I'm always uh, uh, interested in training programs. Is there a kind of training program uh, uh, countrywide or is there a local training program just uh, for the mill itself? And for uh, the presentations we had is uh, how many mills are there uh, actually in that area? And now I'm getting a chat. Um, what from uh, mill? What are the millstones made of? So three very concrete questions. Well, let's start off with the question about training. So Ali, can we invite you to talk about how you train uh, your young millers. We've uh, seen a, a young miller in your video. So tell us about how you're training your millers, please. We actually are just Tino and somebody to train as a miller and he just works alongside me. So working alongside you, observing, yeah. and then gradually you uh, pass over the controls and, uh, and give stand in the stand in the background while he does it. Brilliant. And, and how's that going? Is it is actually, the mill is actually running right now with him as I sit speaking to you. Right, so a proof's in the pudding. <laughs> yes, <laughs> You'll be well, going back in a few minutes to uh, work out what's going yeah. on. Thank you. And what about, you know, how many mills historically were in the area of the Bursi mill? Well, we're the only mill, a working mill in Orkney, and we're the only one in the world that actually does the bare mill, as far as we can understand. But going back oh, 50, 60 years and plus, there was 48 working mills in Orkney. Right, so 48 now down to one. That gives down us some sense. Yeah, uh, and the importance of maintaining and, uh, and enhancing what you're doing. Yeah, and that, well. And, and the next question was about the millstones. What are the millstones made of? We saw there were three sets of millstones performing slightly different functions, I think. Yeah, well, one comes with France. It's, uh, I can't pronounce the name, it's a big low name. It's a quartz. It's the French um, first stone. Yeah, and then the other two comes from England. Right, so I suspect they're probably people we might call peak stones. Yeah. Okay, so there's three questions there, Eric. Um, so do we have uh, another question? Uh, we still got a little bit of time, so uh, some more questions, please. Yes, we have uh, another question coming from Alisa. Um, could Ali the Miller uh, uh, like to comment on the Orkney Flower Project uh, in conjunction with the Highlands and the, uh, and the Island University? I personally don't know where it is, is about, but uh, probably uh, uh, the, the one who is going to answer knows what the subject is. Ali, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, we don't work with any other body. We do it all the marketing through our sales. Right. Um, and if you want to find out more, if you go online, you would find more about the bear meal flower. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Right. I can see another question there from Bob Koblenz, uh, where he is asking about the journeyman phase to the training. Now, I think what Bob is referring to there is a stage once the uh, trainee has sort of passed um, in initial training. Um, do you then have a, an, another stage that uh, is sort of further observation? Perhaps um, you're giving them more more time and space to do the work themselves. Yeah, but we will be hoping that the market will go up that it could take two of us to work it. As it does, one person can work the mill, but hopefully the market will go up and we'll be able to take somebody full time. Right, so actually, as you see the, the market for the flower increasing, yeah. the meal increasing, then that will enable you to have more people working for longer. Yeah. And, uh, we do all the packaging in the mill too. 
interesting. Thank you. And uh, sorry, I can just see the question here, Eric. So if I may, I'll ask it, which is what is the construction of the vent chimney uh, above the kiln? Pardon, can you say that again? So uh, there's a question about the construction of the chimney above the kiln. Yeah, that's just for the, well, it's just a lump to let the reek out, uh, out of the kiln. Right, so that lets the uh, lets the the, the smoke and, and the and the uh, hot air out. Yeah, it's more just a hot air because there's not just a lot of, because burning the scrubs, it doesn't uh, burn, it doesn't put a lot of stuff in the atmosphere. Right, thank you. Eric, what questions more do you have? Uh, there's one other uh, question about training. Uh, if you are a trainee in a miller, do you study uh, just that specific mill, or do you uh, also have to study other mills? Because that's a kind of discussion in the Netherlands also. No, no, because, it, well, in Orkney, we're the only mill. And to do <laughs> that, you would have to go, I don't think there's any other windmills, even in Scotland. You would have to go to a windmill down in England, so we just concentrate on our own mill. Okay, all right. That's easier than in the Netherlands. Uh, we have a lot of mills in a, in, a, in a very small area. Yeah. Yes, it's certainly more difficult, not only for Scotland, but for other parts of the UK. Um, I can see another question, which has come up here, yes. which is how is the grain transferred between the three different sets of stones? It's, it it's all goes up a belt with cups and then doing agar. So you've got a, a cup. It's all so... designed that it goes into one, onto the second, onto the third. And you let then be between that, you lift it up with the water wheel from floor to floor in bags, 50, 50 kilo bags. Right, so still using good traditional bags. So a mixture of the sack hoist by the sounds of it, sounds as though you've got an elevator. It, it's all, all done by the water wheel. Thank you very much indeed. Just checking in if we have any more questions, please, Eric. Yes, there is a large question. Uh, I have to read it myself first. Uh, maybe you can uh, read with me. Um, it's uh, the question from uh, Richard Martin. Yeah. Uh, um, he's, uh, he is interested to know if the main constraint on developing flower milling is suitable equipment, uh, suitable workers, or a market that demands uh, cheaper prices. Well, I'm just wondering, Eric, if we might pick that question up when we have our group discussion a little bit later on, because that yeah. seems to be quite a yeah. number of different elements yeah. in that, doesn't that? Great stuff. Um, well, I'm just wondering if uh, we, uh, I can just see actually another question coming in and maybe have that as the last question uh, yeah. before we move on to our next presentation. And that's from Andrew Finden. Uh, how do you separate the husk from the grain after the first pair of stones. Ali, could we ask you that? The husk is separated when it goes through the first set of stones. It just cracks it outside of the grain and the husk comes off and it goes down through a set, what we call a set of fanners that blows the husk off into a wee shade. And then the dry grain goes up the side and back up the belt with the cups on. Great. So actually, it's a series of fans. So you're using air to push the, yeah. uh, the husk off. Well, yeah, it's just the old set of fanners. And I think that's the original set for 1873. Shows that things last even then. In the, uh, Mo most of the stuff in the mills lasted for 1873. That's just fantastic to hear. It really is. Well, Ali, it's great to uh, to be able to shine a light on the great work that you and the Trust are doing. And we want to thank you so much for taking part in our conference today. We're going to invite you to uh, join us in the Q&A session a little bit later on. Um, if people want to see more about uh, the, uh, the Barony Mill, um, we'll be making sure the links to the website are available for everybody um, at the end of the conference and obviously you can pick up some of the points um, from the video that we are uh, sharing afterwards. By the way, uh, I've moved uh, out of the main uh, mill just now uh, in order that the guys can actually restart production. Um, as you can imagine, they've got a really busy schedule today. Um, so I uh, just wanted to make sure that the uh, Miller uh, and the team were able to carry on. 
But now um, we're going to uh, come down country. We're actually going to go to a different country. We've gone from Scotland uh, and we're now going to go to Wales. Now we heard uh, from the video that uh, the Barony Mill and the Bell Mill is a direct result of um, the types of grain which actually grow and adapted to the climate in Orkney. Well, now we're going to, uh, as one part of the presentation uh, from Emma Williams of Efelin Water Mill at St Dogmills and Anne Parry of the Felin Gannel Water Mill, a little bit further up the coast uh, in West Wales, we're going to hear a bit about the heritage of those mills, but also about the Welsh Grain Forum and the work that's going on there. So I'm now going to pass over to Emma Williams to introduce Efelin. Come from Wales. Croeso Cones or Gymru. My name is Emma Williams and I'm the miller at Avelin. And myself and my colleague Anne Parry are going to be talking about Welsh mills and Welsh grain. In 1977, my parents bought Avelin, a disused water mill with no pond and no wheel, but full machinery and three sets of millstones. In Britain, Prior to the Industrial Revolution, it was estimated there were around about 100,000, 10,000 wind or water powered mills. But by the 1940s, this number had shrunk to about 100. And by the time my parents bought our water mill, there were about 35 wind and water powered mills throughout England, Scotland and Ireland. Although in Wales, there were only about 10. Undaunted, my engineering and enterprising father set about restoring a velin, which means what the mill in Welsh, with the help and support of my mother. And as you can see, the wheel was beyond repair and the interior needed huge amounts of work to restore it back to a working mill. And as for the pond, it was a field with an outline planning permission for houses and the majority had to be redug by large machinery. However, a lot needed to be done by hand to expose the original walls and the clay lining. The white building in the rear of the picture is the mill house and the stone building with the slate roof is the mill. Undaunted and despite the problems of water rights, food hygiene laws, trading standards and the list does go on, my dad continued his renovations. And here you can see my dad stood in the wheel pit with the remnants of the wheel. He was fortunate enough to source a replacement wheel from a water mill not many miles away, which was having to stop milling as the miller had grown too old to continue and had no one to pass his milling skills onto. A sad loss for his mill, which is now a house, as many of these mills are. However, it was a bonus for my dad. And to the right, you can see the launder, which was also in need of a lot of attention. Unable to source any form of monetary help to restore the mill, Dad became a tree surgeon, as it was one sure way to get enough wood for all the renovations and generated an income source at the same time. He became quite a local celebrity, especially when he bought a portable sawmill, essentially to make spokes for the water wheel. He was asked to many country shows to demonstrate the sawmill in action. However, after 18 months of hard work, the mill was fully restored, the pond re-dug and flour was being milled once more. And when I asked my dad where he got the first grain to mill, he looked slightly puzzled and then said, well, from a local farmer. I'm not sure it was milling quality, but it made flour and so I sold it. And over his 40 years of milling, dad built the business up taking the Avelin van all over Dovid as it was, Pembrokeshire as it now is, selling his flour to local bakeries and shops. And in fact, as a learner driver, my driving practice was to deliver many 32 kilogram sacks of flour to local bakeries. My dad formed links with the British farmers who did grow milling quality grain. And although none in Wales, um, he, he managed to get plenty enough grain and he showed many people around his beautifully restored mill, inspiring them to eat stone ground flour. And now 40 years on, I have taken over. This is me looking out of one of the windows. The pond is now a beautiful sight, power to our water wheel, home to our ducks. And as for the flour, as Anne will tell you in a moment, 
local grain is all the rage. And although not accessible readily, we're getting more Welsh grain grown in Wales. And as for the number of water mills, well, mm. there are only three working water mills in Wales, but I like to think that my dad, Mike Hall, was an inspiration to others. Hello, I'm Anne Parry from Bellingham Water Watermill in Llanrusty, which is on the west coast of Wales, about 30 miles north of Emmons Mill to Belling. Um, it's a water mill with two pairs of millstones, and when we moved here in 2006, it hadn't worked for the last 50 years. We set about renovating it slowly with the, with the help of Emma's father and the advice from other people in the Welsh Mill Society. And by 2008, we were milling our first flower again. Um, it had always been our hope that we would be able to mill locally sourced grain. As Emma said, that was quite thin on the ground at the time when we asked people, despite the fact that looking at our day book from 1917, you could see that every farm in the area was bringing in their local grain to be milled. It didn't seem impossible, but the farmers didn't have the confidence to grow that grain anymore. Um, they were repeatedly told by the big mills that, their, that the wheat they produced wasn't up to milling specifications. We were fortunate in it because we had both worked at the University in Aberystwyth and we persuaded them that at what used to be the Welsh plant breeding station, they would sow a small crop of grain for us and see whether we could mill it. And we indeed did that and managed, just like Emma's father had done in the past, to sell, to sell that wheat on the strength of being locally grown. Being 2009, there was a beginning to be a bigger interest in local wheat. And um, we all got together, inspired in, in, in the area, the bakers, the millers and the researchers, inspired by the work of a lot of regional grain networks across the globe. Um, we had held our first meeting in Lampeter in 2013 with the grand idea of reinvigorating the Welsh grain economy, which sounds very important, but the way forward was to work cooperatively and build from the ground upwards. Um, our aims and objectives, you can see here, were that as, as a diverse group of mill users, we saw the economic, environmental, nutritional and cultural benefits of developing a thriving regional grain economy. Um, because our farm records had shown that grain growing was widespread across Wales um, and the farmers were growing wheat varieties which were well adapted to the local environment. Um, since the 1930s, however, grain production had become concentrated towards the east of the UK um, and we were really felt at that time we were in danger of losing any of our grain heritage. So that by, um, by encouraging that, working together, respecting local farming traditions, we hoped, we hoped to reverse what was going on. Um, and we began quite well because we were able to show that small farmers growing Welsh grown grain, which we were able to mill, could produce excellent products. Our bread looked quite reasonable. I think our Victoria sandwiches were pretty good as well. Um, Welsh grown grain wasn't as disappointing as people had been led to believe. The other aspect of our work was to work with a Welsh landrace wheat, which this, this, this was a, a, a wheat which was grown in Wales, it was referred to as Hain Gumro, which means in English, it means old Welshman, probably referring to the bearded ear. Um, looked like an old man, I think, I think that's quite a common naming of Wales. There's also a Hain Gumro barley. Anyway, Hain Gumro wheat was collected, as you can see from um, Griffith Jones in Vronwen um, in Pencarig, where it had been growing according to the Welsh Plant Breeding Stations Register for at least 50 years. And it continued to be grown in Wales up until the 1930s, making it probably the land race wheat that was grown the longest in the British Isles, particularly because it produced a good harvest in these wet Welsh summers that we could get. And whilst it wasn't a large harvest, it was definitely a millable wheat. We've been fortunate enough to work with um, Andy Forbes of the Brockwell Bake Association, who had been taking seed from seed banks and bulking, bulking them back up again, these land race wheats. Um, and he was happy to share his work with us and send the stock, a lot of the stock of Hain Gumro to the Welsh Grain Forum, which as a group has taken over curatorship of the bulk of it. Um, and so now we, we are in a, in a position where the winter wheat is growing again in Wales on small farms and it is being used by a number of, a number of bakers locally. In fact, it's the, the wheat of choice for people with possibly with a Welsh connection for artisan bakers and for chefs um, to use in their loaves. Um, as you can see, it makes a very nice wheat. Here is here are some loads by Rob Penn, made with Hain Gumro. Um, and he has recently written a book entitled Slow Rise about his adventures growing wheat in Wales and, um, and producing his very own loads. And with that rise in interest, 
I think I think that traditional mills are in an excellent position to support that, that movement towards local grain growing and particularly in Wales. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Anne, for a really fascinating insight into both the history of, uh, of the, the, the recovery of traditional milling uh, in Wales, but equally uh, this really important stream, I think, of our workers millers of being able to uh, rediscover and then uh, promote uh, types of wheat, land race wheat, as you describe them, um, which have history, have heritage in our localities. So um, with that, we're going to now open the floor to questions. And again, please put your questions in the chat so that Eric and I can uh, pick up your question. And indeed, I will try this time, seeing if we can then open uh, your, invite you to speak to ask your question yourself. So um, just uh, first of all, checking in, Eric, just to find out what the uh, question stakes are so far, please. Uh, not, not yet, not yet, but I have a, uh, um, a question myself. Um, in Wales, is there uh, any um, um, support from the local government financially or otherwise to restore mills or to, uh, to, to, to train millers? Or is it just uh, uh, dependent on trusts and foundations, etc.? Thank you, Eric. Can we ask Anne Parry, please? Um, no, there, there, there is no, no government support at all. Um, it's, it's entirely dependent on, on interest groups, perhaps, and the Welsh Mills Society has a very small restoration fund, but otherwise it's, it's individual groups and trusts who would have to raise the effort. Or, for example, in Talgarth Mill has re been restored over the last few years, and they, they had a sort of a community interest um, funding from the National Lottery, that they had to apply for that. There's, there's nothing standard that's available. Nothing from the Welsh Government there. Emma, do you have any uh, points on this uh, question? Um, no, like Anne said, there is no money that's that's available from the government um, and individuals do have to, um, if like our mill is, is independently owned as is Anne and Andy's, um, you have to fund everything yourself. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult for the maintenance of, of the mill and to keep it going. Mm, it's a challenging position. Mm. Eric? Okay. And is it because uh, there is no interest or uh, uh, actually uh, money isn't, uh, should, shouldn't be the problem because you can prioritize uh, your, your, your budgets? Is there no interest in the historic mills? Um, well, why is it that the, the government isn't supporting such things? I think there is interest in, in the historic mills. It's just the, the government isn't giving money towards it. I mean, for instance, when dad was looking to renovate a Velin. I know it was a number of years ago, but he was offered money if he wanted to turn it into holiday lets, but nothing if he was going to keep it as a water mill. And I don't think the situation is much different now. Well, and uh, it, the, the story you share is sadly one which is shared beyond Wales in, into the rest of the UK. Um, I've just seen that we have a question there uh, for from Ruth uh, Wills. Uh, Ruth, can we ask you to unmute your microphone um, and fire away, please, with your question? And it's lovely to welcome you from Canada by the looks of it. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, um, my question is related to health and safety uh, regulations. Uh, that's modern health and safety regulations being imposed on a historic. Um, building and mechanical setup and all the rest of that. What kind of hoops do you have to jump through to make sure that you can still run? Um, and uh, do you get any kind of, um, uh, what's the word, exemptions because you're historic? Thank you very much, Ruth. I'll ask that to Emma, please. Um, so with the health and safety, uh, you, we just have to fill in a, in a risk assessment um, just to make sure that when visitors come, they, they are um, careful around the mill. Um, we don't have any problems at the moment, and I'm touching wood. Um, we have more problems with, with food hygiene. 
really. Um, and that's very stringent, but but not with health and safety, I'm pleased to say. I don't know if Anne has anything else to add. Um. No, no, I think I think it's a constant worry. We, we operate like you with, with the risk assessment and, and we have to have public liability insurance, both for the flower and, and for mill, both visitors and volunteers um, and any workers. But yeah, I think it's, it is a matter of holding your breath quite a lot and, and really being careful about who you let in the mill. One, one aspect of it useful is that, is that the mill is actually quite small and fragile, so we, we can't actually have hundreds of tourists or visitors pounding through it, so that does gives us a limited control, I suppose. That's right. Could I have a, a follow-up on that? Uh, I'm afraid time is going to be really tight, but what I'm going to suggest, Ruth, is we'll probably pick this topic up when we have our group discussion a little bit later. Okay. So do hang in there and we'll come back to that. Well, thank you very much indeed once again to Emma Williams, to Anne, uh, and I can see her husband, uh, Andy, hanging in the background there, uh, another key member of the team. Um, so we're now time for our break, uh, and we've got a great opportunity to show you a new five minute film by our colleague Martin Taylor, which showcases uh, some of our other mills uh, in the UK uh, and shows them at their best doing what they were intended to do, uh, milling in this case, they're all corn mills, uh, milling some great flowers. So it's time for a break. Um, so uh, come for break time and we'll see you all in five minutes. Thank you.
Great. Well, I hope you're all back. I hope you didn't leave your desks actually, or your uh, or your seats, because uh, there was absolutely fantastic uh, scenes showing, as I say, a number of our uh, mills in the UK from across the UK. So we hope you enjoyed that. It will be available on the catch up uh, if uh, you missed anything uh, whilst you were uh, taking a comfort break. So we're now back and it's time to carry on. And um, we, in the first two presentations, have learned quite a lot about how uh, the mills have adapted to suit particular grains grown in particular localities. Uh, now we're going to look at how a group have worked together uh, as a group of partners and indeed other volunteers uh, to both uh, repair, conserve, protect and bring back to life uh, Wiccan windmill. Uh, that's uh, been over uh, a period now of 30 odd years, uh, a long period. And so we're now going to introduce Dave Pierce, um, who is going to tell us about uh, the Wiccan Windmill Partnership, Volunteer Millwrights, Millers and Friends. So over to you, Dave. I'm Dave Pierce of the Wiccan Windmill Partnership, and I've been asked to give a brief presentation on the work of the partnership and the associated Wiccan mill, uh, Millwrights. The partnership was founded in 1987 to restore what was then an extremely derelict smock windmill with the subsequent purpose of maintaining the mill in working order. And of course, this has all helped us to sustain the crafts of windmilling and mill writing. We had to do all the work ourselves because of funding issues, but we really wanted to do that anyway. We've learnt more of the mill writing skills as we went, and we had some grant aid from the then English Heritage and from the local district council and other sources. We came with a certain amount of previous experience, as you see. A little bit of history. The mill went out of use in 1933 when the bank foreclosed on the business. Sounds very modern. The photo was taken in 1935 and already the sales were getting a bit tatty, but the mill did continue to work by engine through the Second World War for the assistance particularly of local farmers. When we came along, Chris Wilson of Overmill had already fitted a temporary roof which undoubtedly saved the mill. And in the photo, we're tentatively starting initial work to patch up empty door holes and windows just to make the mill secure and a bit more weatherproof. Eventually the restoration was completed and every year we hold a week-long session of maintenance and overhaul. This year we particularly worked on the brake wheel where attention was needed to the centering of the wheel. The wind shaft doesn't quite suit the wheel, this is not perhaps unusual. And improvements have been made. We fitted an extra truss at the rear of the centering of the wheel, which we hope will cure any problems of metal fatigue which have been occurring. Wiccan Mill has got an interesting train of gears from the fantail to steer the mill into the wind, including a, a wooden gear. I think this is probably unique now in British uh, working windmills. It requires continual attention from us, I can assure you. And this year we had a broken tooth to replace. You can see in the left hand slide, uh, a new tooth more or less ready for fitting. We've learned a lot about stone dressing over the years. And you can see on the left, the millwright looking happy and perhaps just a little relieved that the stone has been successfully raised uh, safely and without damage to anything else. Stone dressing. Um, Traditionally, red has been used to show up a, a high spots on the stone. These days we use children's poster paint and not red ochre. 
there is a crack up brickwork of the base of the well running up from the main door and that has probably been a present since the mill was built in about 1813. The crack does not appear to be moving in the 30 years that we've been there but we decided to provide everybody with a little reassurance by fitting a reinforcing ring round the tower. You see it here just as after it has been fitted. It's, it's now toned down, having been tarred over the gloss paint. And in the right hand shot, the crack is being mortared up. We'll see what happens. Wiccan Mill is fortunate in having a little foundry. This has been a great help to us. We had a lot of castings to remake at the time of the restoration. The foundry has been cold for about 20 years, but it's recently been refurbished in order to provide shutter fittings for Wiccan Mill and also for the ancient post mill at Gransden, the other end of Cambridgeshire, which is being gradually restored and we hope the new set of sales will go on next year. Rob Bramley is in charge of the foundry in this shot. You see the furnace is going well and the moulding boxes in the middle foreground are ready to take shutter fitting castings. We need a good workshop. It seems to me to be fundamental to any mill writing activity. It's housed for us in the old granary buildings of Wiccan Mill. We were aware in 1987 that they badly needed re-roofing. At last, we are getting around to doing that. This is the third stage of uh, repairs. And here the uh, wooden foundation of the roof is, is in place and new galvanized steel sheeting is going on and this will be an ongoing process over the next few years that the workshop's quite extensive we like to help on other mills where we can and it does help increase our knowledge of mill writing at Gransden again we've been working on the mechanics of the mill and here we're reassembling the the brake system you see the nice temporary blue plastic rope. And on the right, we've been doing extensive work on the Foxton pumping windmill near Cambridge. It is quite a unique thing. The fantail style of sails with their interesting spring shutters. There's six blades, the other four are waiting to be fitted. And they're sitting at Wicking at the moment. Back to the main mill, protecting the mill against the weather is fundamental to sustaining any smock or post mill. And we, these days, tar the tower every four years on average. And that's not dissimilar to what the old millwrights used to do in the distant past. The sails also need attention every year we go over tightening up all the fixings and again every four years on average the sails need to be completely repainted that might sound a lot but uh, at Wiccan I feel we get a rare pasting from the weather and from the peat dust in the summer storms from the local fens we also have to protect the corn inside the mill from the peat dust, I might add, with, with extra tarpaulins over the sacking in the summer particularly. So to summarise, how does the partnership sustain the windmill? We gather together friends to work on the mill, doing on, work on ourselves minimises costs and spreads and maintains skills. And of course, windmilling is a rare skill now and mill writing is endangered both in the UK and in Europe and in the rest of the windmilling areas. Continual careful maintenance reduces the need for major repairs but doesn't altogether remove that need. 
To buy materials, we rely on sales of high quality flour and on donation. It's a difficult path, but a successful one so far, and we still enjoy working on the windmills. Thank you. Dave, thank you very, very much. And what an inspiring story just to show actually how a group of dedicated colleagues are able to pretty much uh, face anything which seems to come down the track in terms of their maintenance, repair, and indeed operation of their mill, producing some fantastic flour along with some fantastic castings, although I don't think I'd mix them both together. <laughs> Um, but anyhow, let's uh, hear from uh, Dave uh, and let's uh, now find out your questions. So I can see one from Gerard Trust there. Um, so I'm going to just uh, sneak in because I saw there was one from Eric earlier. But Gerard, can we open up your microphone, please, and uh, ask your question to Dave Pierce? Yes, uh, thank you, John. I was wondering uh, in Holland, uh, it is not allowed to use any coal tar uh, because of the environment. Uh, but is it allowed uh, in the UK to use uh, any tar products? Tar is a problem in the UK as in Europe. I think we can to an extent still use coal tar if we can acquire it, if we can buy it. Uh, we don't use coal tar anymore on Wiccan Mill, uh, but we are still open to suggestions as to the best products to use. So I agree it is a difficult one, uh, probably not absolutely prohibited in this country, but uh, uh, difficult to obtain. Well, thank you, David. Yeah, it is very difficult to get hold of it and, and becoming prohibited, I think, is the stage. So here, thank you very much for that question. Um, I did see one from Eric. Uh, so Eric, uh, could we uh, over to you about uh, how the profession of the miller is recognised? Yeah, well, the, there, there was a question uh, uh, about the profession of the miller. Um, and in the Netherlands, it's uh, recognized uh, by uh, UNESCO, the UNESCO organization, and it's put on the, on the list. Um, but I understand that's not the same in the UK, or is it? It's not really the same, although I note the Heritage Crafts Association have a red list of endangered crafts on which uh, mill writing is uh, very much an endangered species. Um, I think there's a general recognition that there is a, a great shortage of mill rights, young mill rights and millers coming along for the future. But I would not, and John probably knows rather more about this, but uh, I'm not clear that we have the answers in this country yet. There is a lot of work to do on this topic, Eric, I think it's fair to say, and sadly, uh, as we've heard from Wales already, the UK just doesn't enjoy the same level of government support, um, and there's probably some new work we need to do with uh, UNESCO as well. Well, I'm afraid there are more questions, but I'm going to keep our time scale, uh, our timings to plan, and if I can ask Eddie uh, and colleagues to ask those questions uh, when we get to the Q&A, which is going to follow uh, our final presentation today. So now we're coming back to Can Mills, where I am uh, today, and uh, I'm now going to introduce you to Michael Stokes. Well, it was interesting in the last presentation, um, Dave Pierce telling us about the dust uh, from storms of across the Fens in Cambridgeshire. Um, it was a storm here last night as well. So uh, when uh, Michael uh, R. Miller, who we're going to meet in a moment, uh, went outside yesterday evening, he was rather surprised to see a, a waste, waste bin floating past him in the yard uh, because actually the uh, mill pond had overflowed and flooded uh, the lower yard here at Can Mills. Um, so we might hear a bit about that later. You'll be relieved to know uh, that everything is back in order and the mill uh, has been working all day. But anyhow, without further ado, uh, let me now hand over to Michael to talk about Can Mills, a 21st century working water mill. Michael. My name is Michael Stote and I'm the miller at Can Mills near Shaftesbury in Dorset. I'm a fifth generation miller. Our milling heritage started in 1832, taking on the lease of a small water mill in Somerset, then shortly after taking on the town mill in nearby Watchet. This began as a stone mill being driven from a water turbine and then moving through the industrial revolution to a full roller plant powered by steam. 
1912, the business moved to a new roller mill at Temple Back in Bristol. And this was later bought out by the then milling giant Spillers, who carried on using it up until the 50s. But my focus today is on can mills and its evolution over the last 70 years. My father purchased can mills in 1947. It was a working feed mill, supplying local farms with animal feed and coal, which seemed to go hand in hand at the time. The mill is on the River Sturkle, a tributary to the River Stour, and this powered the 19th century overshot water wheel, generating about 12 horsepower. At this time, the water powered a pair of peak stones, a mixer, and various elevators and augers. A diesel engine provided additional power for a hammer mill. In 1954, the mill was totally destroyed by a fire. It was thought a manifold on the diesel engine overheated and started the fire. For my father, only seven years into the business, this was devastating, but he made the bold decision to have the mill rebuilt. I say bold because at this time there was much competition from the larger, more commercial feed mills and the future of the smaller country mill was bleak. Using industrial materials of the day, an ugly prefab concrete box was built with structural design to take a third floor if required in the future. The millwrights, Joseph Armfield from Ringwood, fitted out the running gear in the mill. The original pit wheel and crown wheel were reinstated and a drive taken up to a line shaft which ran the length of the mill. Machinery was built driven off the line shaft. There was a separate engine room and an additional diesel engine installed to drive a cuba. The business was up and running within a year. Cubes went out to farms either in Hessian sacks or in a bulk tank which slid on the back of a flatbed lorry. The feed side of the business carried on until about 1970. By this time farms had got larger as had the main feed mills who continued to squeeze out the smaller country mill. The handful of employees at can mills were nearing retirement so my father decided to wind down the animal feed and start milling stone ground flour in a small way. He had already set up a small stone ground flour plant in the mill. There was a wooden hearse frame from an old windmill which housed a three foot ten pair of French burr stones driven by electric motor. A four inch bucket elevator took the flour up two floors and fed it into an arm field six foot centrifugal for sieving. The flour then dropped into a wooden bin for bagging. Two further sets of millstones were added to the mill, both three foot six, mounted in cast iron hearst frames and belt driven from a line shaft. During the 70s, there was a resurgence for wholemeal flour and a good business was built up on this new demand. Most of the flour went to whole food shops, which sold the flour loose from open sacks. If it had not been for the fire in 1954, the mill would by now have been grade two listed and the future potential of the milling business hugely curtailed. Instead, we had an ugly building with no historic interest to the planners but with structural design to allow the business to continue evolving organically over the following decades. I joined the business in the 80s, during which we saw the growth in the supermarkets and the start of their impact to independent retailers on the high street. One positive aspect of the supermarkets was that they introduced us in the UK to a wider range of continental breads. Not necessarily particularly done well, but enough to get our taste buds going. This slowly created a demand for more interesting breads and enthusiastic bakers broke away from the traditional mould. Moving on 20 years, the artisan baker is now producing a diverse range of sourdough and crafted breads readily available on most high streets. This has been a great opportunity for the traditional stone ground flour miller.
During this period, we installed a cast iron double hearse frame with two pairs of four foot French burr stones. Originally, we drove these off a single electric motor via a lay shaft to the bevel gears under each set of stones. We later converted these to be independently and directly driven with wedge belts from a motor. Our preference towards belt drives even took us to the pit wheel, where we converted this to a flat pulley, taking a belt drive to a lay shaft and then up to the main line shaft. We find, we find the Power transmission has improved, the noise is reduced, but probably most importantly, the downtime is reduced if there's a breakdown. In 2004, we installed our first Euromill with composite stones. Another one followed in 2013. For these, we use a vacuum pump and reverse jet filter to take the flour away, as it is a self-cleaning system and keeps the product and stones cooler. I am passionate about the method of producing a quality stone ground product but are for our artisan bakers, but I am open to introducing modern twists if they enhance the product or improve the working environment. After 55 years of waiting, the concrete box finally got its hat on, and in 2009 we added another floor space incorporated using a mansard roof design. This has given us additional space for storing our packaging and packing the one and a half kilogram retail bags. We also now have a pitch roof, which is so much better at keeping the rain out than the previous flat roof. In 2012, we modified and improved the grain storage and handling plant. This is a now more hygienic system and can accommodate the 29 tonne grain deliveries. In the next 12 months, we'll be installing a purpose designed dust extraction system to reduce the amount of residual dust in the mill and make it a safer working environment as well as hopefully reducing the cleaning hours presently required. After the fire in 1954, Can Mills could easily have taken another course in its thousand year history. Probably the most likely outcome would have been for a residential development with no likelihood of reverting to anything industrial. As it is today, Can Mills is a thriving business, employing four full-time and three part-time staff we buy grain directly from local farms and support several local contractors and help minimise food miles to many local food producers and outlets. This is sustainable and helps the local economy. It's been and still is a very rewarding and enjoyable occupation. My son Oliver joined the business five years ago and will hopefully be able to take the baton and evolve the business further over the next few decades as custodian at Can Mills and a sixth generation miller. Thank you. And over to you, John. Michael, thank you. And actually, Michael joins me now. Uh, we're back in uh, the uh, ground floor of the mill, so you can hear the water wheel behind us. Uh, the machinery is a little bit quieter now, uh, but uh, what an incredible story, both in terms of the survival of the mill, but equally um, making uh, and the transformation that's been going on to make the mill such a focal point in the 21st century. So we've now time for some questions. So as before, um, be grateful to have those questions in the chat. Eric, uh, can you help us out here? Well, not yet, not yet. Just give me a few seconds. Maybe uh, uh, the people are typing their messages now. Um, and indeed, I uh, agree with uh, John. What an incredible story. And I. Uh, did I understand it correctly that you're the fifth generation Miller? Yes, I'm the fifth generation. Yes, oh, sir. wow. <laughs> I, I, I would have uh, um, uh, enjoyed uh, shaking hands with you, to <laughs> shake hands with a, with a fifth generation Miller. <laughs> so, so that's five generations. Well, I'm going to have got a question here for Michael, which is, I know from my own milling business that the kinds of flour that our customers are buying 
is changing. If I look at the products that we were selling 10 years ago, they're subtly different from what we're selling now. So Michael, what have you noticed about the demand for flour and the kind of products that your customers are buying? Yes, I think the independent, the bakers, the commercial bakers, they're always, they're looking for a story behind the, um, story behind the flour that they buy. Um, so it's selecting the grains and have a story behind the grains. I think this is really important. Um, for the, um, the domestic baker, I think they just want an, the honesty of the product and the provenance of it. I think that's, uh, that, that's with, with food safety being an issue in, um, in the media all the time. I think provenance is, is a major factor too. So provenance in terms of the farms that you're working with equally, you see the fact the mills, the flowers milled here. Yeah, the short food on. chain and uh, transparent food chain and uh, yeah, yes, yeah, so uncomplicated process. And, and right, and that important thing about the uncomplicated processing, customers knowing what they're buying seems to be a really important factor that we're all aware of. Thank you. Eric, any more questions coming yeah. in? Yes, um, a question from uh, 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 Gerard Proust from the Netherlands. Um, he, he is really enthusiastic about the new machines in your traditional mill. And he asks you if you are a member of the traditional um, uh, corn millers guild and uh, um, whether or you are not a, uh, a member, how many members does the guild have? Um, yes, I'm a, a founder member, in fact, of the um, traditional corn millers guild. Um, I don't know, how, I've forgotten how many years ago it was now, probably a John 35 years ago, I think, yes. <laughs> yes. so quite some time now. Um, and what's the membership now? Are we up to 20? Well, we'll find out a little bit more about that, actually, from uh, Jenny uh, shortly. Uh, so uh, hold on for that one, but I, I, I'll give you a clue. It's over 30. So... And just tell us a bit more about the machinery. So we've we've got the, we can see a hearse frame behind us here. So most people will recognise this. And this is the one driven by the wind, the water. water. There you yeah. go, wind. I'm, I'm a wind miller after all. <laughs> so I, I started off using um, wooden stone covers, and then um, went over to using these plastic ones here. Um, not so traditional, I must say, but um, practical on a hygienic um, aspect, and also. Um, they seem to last a long time. Well, they last last forever, really. So, um, uh, much 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 easier for cleaning. Right. But taking advantage of modern innovations, but still absolutely the core, a traditional mill that our predecessors and all of us involved in traditional milling would recognise. Well, I'm going to suggest that we now bring in our colleagues from the other presentations and broaden this conversation out. So we've got time now for a more general question and answer session. So we had a question about health and safety a little bit earlier on from our colleague in Canada. So I'm actually gonna suggest that maybe we could start with that. So we'll, well, let's just check in with our presenters. So we've got Michael here, we've got Dave Pierce, we've got Anne Parry, we've got Emma Williams, uh, Ali's uh, in from uh, Scotland. Uh, so we're all now here and the questions are for the group. But let's go back to that question uh, in Canada. Um, my sincere apologies, I haven't got your name in front of me, but if you'd like to unmute yourself, you know who you are, and just remind us of your subsequent question, please, about safety in traditional mills. Sure, thank you. Uh, again, my name is Ruth Mills, and I'm actually from Watson's Mill in um, Ottawa, Canada. Uh, yeah, my first question was about health and safety, and uh, this, the subsequent question would be about hygiene. Um, I know that is the, the the rules are very tight, uh, certainly here in Canada. And um, uh, if you walk into our mill, um, I we are a historic uh, location, so we have certain amount of um, flexibility uh, with with hygiene. But we do sell our flour, so we have to come up to hygienic standards. So I'm just curious about how other other mills uh, manage and uh, cope with uh, hygiene. Thank you very much, Ruth. Well, I'm actually going to ask Michael to lead us off on that question. Uh, big challenge when you have a mill the size of this, Michael. Yes, no, this is, um, it, it's, it's an ongoing um, system and we're improving on it all the time. Um, we do have inspections from um, environmental health and um, they're very supportive of what we do here. So um, we go along with, with their suggestions and the 
industrial standards sometimes are a bit of a, a sledgehammer to crack a walnut, not necessarily um, relevant to what we're doing here. So we have to sort of um, massage, I suppose, the regulations to fit into our sort of type of business, really, which um, so far the environmental health and trading standards have been supportive of. So in, tell us a little bit about the cleaning processes you use and the regularity of cleaning for a big space like this. Right, so obviously different zones of the mill get more messy than others. Um, and so, so we do have a cleaning schedule. This is attended to weekly. Um, so different areas are hit more frequently than others. Um, it's all dry cleaning. Um, so we've got industrial um, apex rated hoovers um, for, for sucking up the dust. Um, uh, webbing brushes for knocking the dust off ledges, because that, that's the important thing, dust settling on ledges that you can't necessarily see. Um, but if there were a dust explosion, this is what can cause the secondary um, secondary explosion um, from the dust that falls off the ledges. Yeah, yeah. So it's important to keep keep that clear. Um, and obviously road pest control, most water mills are it's an ideal hotel for the rat. It's um, a dry place to go with plenty of food and uh, on a water course. So um, it's uh, obviously a, a challenge to um, keep up with them, but with regular basting, this, this can be done. Right. Thank you. So regular cleaning. Well, let's hear from Dave Pierce because um, I'm, you know, Michael was talking there about you know dust on ledges. The mill mop is another challenge, especially in a windmill. So let's hear from Dave on this question of hygiene, please. Yes, uh, certainly mill moth is uh, a constant problem, constant vigilance. I think we, is what we must observe. In fact, uh, this morning I was taking down our flower dresser. It's important to have machines which can be broken down into small components for cleaning. A lot of the old stuff was not. Um, on general risks, we, we obviously pay a lot of attention to the assessment of risks for any of the tasks we carry out. You saw the foundry, we change over sales every so often on the mill. Uh, all of this is the subject of very careful assessment and written procedures, which are, of course, gradually refined as time goes on. Um, but it's just a matter of keeping at the cleaning as far as the hygiene is concerned. We, we can't let up. The, the mill was clearly not designed to modern standards of, uh, of uh, cleanliness. Um, and in fact, I'm very proud to say that we have an original cat flap in the mill door, uh, which we are encouraged to keep closed because no longer, it was obvious to the 19th century miller that you had a cat that came in and out whenever to deal with the rodents. But uh, now we're much more concerned, obviously, about odd cat hairs getting into the flower and anything like that, quite reasonably so. So I'm not criticizing that, but it just shows that uh, things are ever getting more uh, complex and uh, but so far I would say I would agree with Michael that um, that uh, the authorities tend to be very supportive in tr trying to help to keep the last few traditional mills running. There seems to be a theme here working with our local authorities the people who are responsible for holding the regulations and working with them so that we can uh, adapt, understand their needs, and equally help them understand the reality of what we're doing and find a way together. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Eric, our next question, please. The question is uh, about um, uh, edit, uh, additives to flour. Um, what do traditional millers do about legally required additives uh, in flour? Uh, and possibly not wanted by the customers. Uh, this is a very hot topic and uh, one uh, which I'm going to uh, bat across to Anne Parry to start us off on this one, please. Anne, what would you say to this question? Um, well, we are a very small mill and we, we tend to avoid, avoid problems rather, rather than um, face this head on. Um, I encourage all my customers to use whole meal, which kind of lets me out of the problem of um, of having of having to include additives but as, as you rightly say and i think you're much better fitted to to speak to this it's an ongoing problem 
just so that everyone is aware, in the UK, uh, we have what's called the bread and flour regulations, which require a minimum level of particular nutrients and vitamins, which typically are taken out in the process of sieving or dressing flour to produce white flour. So wholemeal flour has those levels of additives, which is what I'm referring to. Other flours do not. Emma, would you like to come in on this point? Have you had much conversation with your customers about additives? Yeah, they're very keen not to have any additives um, added to any of the flours. In fact, that's a that's a, a lot of the questions that they ask. Is there anything added to this? Um, they're very reluctant to to buy anything with additives. Um, and, and I have to say, like Anne, I try and, and encourage people to eat wholemeal because why wouldn't you? And if you want to dress it out yourself, you can just sieve it. So it just makes life easier. <laughs> Indeed. Michael, tell us about any thoughts you have on additives. It's supposed to be a question that you face too. Yeah, I mean, nearly all the products we um, produce and sell are is organic, certified organic. And in, in my view, in talking to my customers, they're quite shocked when they hear that these additives should be added to an organic product they assume that it should be unadulterated and just be from the natural wheat or or grain or and not have certainly synthetic uh, additives added to it so um yeah it, it is a bit of a shock to the customers and it's um not, not something i i want to get too involved in <laughs> thank you so this is a really topical issue uh some of you will also be aware that the uk is now uh, has made a decision that folic acid will be added to uh, flowers other than wholemeal. So we have an obligation by law, um, but you've heard from these various uh, you know, contributions that it's an area which there's a lot of debate around and many customers don't want it. So an area which we're evolving a conversation around. Let's go on to our next question. I can see one here from Aileen uh, Hansing. So Aileen, Aileen, could we ask you to ask your question, please? Sure. Hi. Um, I'm bringing. I'm, I'm calling in from Germany. Um, you can probably hear from the accent that I'm actually Irish, but uh, I landed here. We're in the process of restoring a historical windmill, which has hasn't produced feed since about 1987, and hasn't produced flour since about the 1940s. Sometime we're very keen to get back into production. Um, we have relatively limited um, dressing, uh, or will have very relatively limited dressing capabilities. Um, my question is, if we're uh, producing whole grain flour, what kind of shelf life, um, in other words, where the wheat germ is not, has not been removed and, and sterilized, um, what, uh, yeah, what kind of shelf life do, do people offer on their whole grain product? Okay, well, we're going to go to Scotland. Thank you very much for the question, Eileen. I think I've got your pronunciation hopefully about right now. Um, let's go to Scotland and ask Ali, what about shelf life for the bear meal? And we can, I hope, then go to Jenny Hartland after that. Ali. Hi. No, we have a life shell for about seven months, but mm. it'll last a lot longer. So you have a best before date of seven months. Thank you yeah. very much indeed, Ali. Um, Jenny, we haven't heard from you, or we'll be hearing from you in a moment as the chairman of our traditional coal miners guild. Any thoughts, please, from you? Well, I can uh, speak. Hello. I can uh, speak from my experience at my own mill where we put a six month shelf life on our flour uh, I've got to say none of our flour sits on our shelves for anywhere near six months uh, and like um, we've just heard from Ali uh, we're pretty confident that it uh, has a longer life than that but we, we go with six months and I think that's fairly standard um, across the uh, uh, our members Thank you very much indeed, Jenny. We'll just also just drop to Mildred Cookson, um, also to say thank you for her presentation earlier on. Mildred, anything you've come across in terms of this best before date, uh, the longevity of flour? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, normal, like Jenny said, sort of five, six, five, six months sort of shelf life. That's depending on, you know, where the mill is, where the flour is stored, of course, in a, in a dry atmosphere and uh, not, you know, damp water mills can be a bit of a problem sometimes at storing flour. So as long as you've got a dry storage area, you, you, you're probably quite safe. But as Jenny says, most of it comes and goes from the mill 
in my time anyway, within within a week, it's the, the shelf's empty and you start again. So, uh, yeah, and I think the bakers probably use it up fairly rapidly as well. So it's the turnover is, you know, much, much less than six months. It's probably, you know, six, seven, eight weeks even sometimes. So, uh, but the, the flour will keep. And, you know, people say you get weevils in the flour and things like this. But I think as long as the grain is well cleaned before you start, then there's absolutely no problem. And don't keep the flour stored in plastic bags. <laughs> yeah, keeping, certainly not keeping flour in plastic bags. And yes, I think recognising there that it, the, the, the flour stays for a short time in our mills, but of course it can stay on a, on a, uh, on a shop shelf for a longer period of time. Yeah, so definitely. Certainly our, our general view, Eileen, in the UK is six months for your best before date, um, mm -hmm. but your flour would easily be bakeable for another six months plus after yeah, yeah. that uh, if it's stored in a cool, dry conditions. Yeah. Well, I think that's about all we've got time for in terms of our questions. Um, while Michael's here, I'm just going to once more say on behalf of you all, uh, thank you for having us here today, uh, for sharing uh, the mill, um, and what a great day to see it. Uh, also, thanks to the team for uh, uh, keeping out, <laughs> out of the way um, in the nicest possible way. Um, so that we could uh, do this recording uh, in uh, the centre of the mill. So thank you very much indeed. Well, now I'm going to hand over to Jenny, who you've uh, just uh, heard a moment ago, uh, to round off our conference and also tell you a bit more about the other organisation uh, that uh, supports and indeed uh, promotes traditional milling in the UK, uh, the Traditional Corn Millers Guild. So Jenny, over to you. Hello. I'm Jenny Hartland, and I am the chair of the Traditional Corn Millers Guild, which Mildred mentioned in her introduction. I'm also a trustee, a voluntary miller and millwright at Holgate Windmill in York. This is a very beautiful mill. It was built in 1770 and as such is probably one of the earliest working tower mills in our country. And it has five rather stunningly beautiful double shuttered sails. We've seen all sorts of mills today, a wonderful collection, all the, and very different. But they all, uh, all the working mills are members of the traditional Corn Millers Guild. Our guild is a group of millers from nearly 40 water mills, uh, water and windmills, all milling to a high standard in a traditional way and selling their flour, usually locally. The mills vary in many ways. As I've already mentioned, and you've seen, they come from all over the British Isles. We've been up to Orkney, down to the southwest, into Wales and across to East Anglia. They are, many of them are water-driven, about twice as many are water-driven, and some are wind-driven. The styles of ownership and management are many and various. They go from uh, community groups, like the one that runs my mill, um, to individual owners who, for whom that mill is their livelihood and everything in between, including tenants of uh, landowners and local authorities. The scale of production varies hugely too, everything from uh, five or six tonnes of wheat a year to many hundreds of tonnes. Some are organic, some are non-organic, and some are even a bit of a mixture of both. The members are united by a number of other elements. Then probably top of that list is the love of traditional mills and their buildings and traditional milling techniques. We all have a commitment to producing quality stone ground flour and promoting it as a food product and, and uh, encouraging adventurous baking. The use of horizontal millstones is uh, common to all of us, and the use of natural power sources, wind and water, and the reduction of food miles as well. These are extremely good green credentials which we promote. We're a very supportive network. We help each other with information and problems. We maintain and guarantee high standards. And when necessary, we are a campaigning force. Over the past two years, together with SPAD Mills section, we've worked to influence legislation on the addition of folic acid to flour. We've certainly made an impression on that 
for uh, on that for, for that <laughs> from that campaign, uh, but we haven't quite yet won our hoped for exemption. I'd like to say a very big thank you to everyone who has taken part in this afternoon's event and made the whole event part of our ever increasing network across borders. Well, thank you very much indeed, Jenny, uh, indeed for sharing that uh, introduction or indeed conclusion, um, uh, talking about the traditional corn millers guild and uh, all the work that's going on there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of the formal part of our conference. Um, and so I would like to pass on my sincere thanks to the team who have helped create today's conference, to Mildred Cookson, to Jenny Hartland, to Martin Taylor for his fantastic uh, interval film, which will be available, as I say, on the recording, uh, to all our presenters, to Ali Harkus, to Anne Parry, to Emma Williams, to Dave Pierce, and to Michael Stote. Um, and thank you to you for joining our conference, uh, for helping us, the network, uh, to fulfill our mission, uh, which is to protect and promote the craft of traditional milling. So with that, uh, I'm gonna hand you back uh, to Nicole uh, in the Netherlands, truly global uh, organization we are here. And um, I'll see you shortly, as they say, uh, in the breakout rooms. Nicole, over to you. Thank you, John. Um, as John said, we're going out in the breakout rooms now. That will take a bit of time, so please hang on and our technicians will set you in a room. There are some people uh, more or less moderating it, but it's uh, the, the idea that we get to network and chat with each other on any topic you want. So um, please uh, wait until you're in your breakout room and we'll see you afterwards. Thanks. Um, and we're now coming to the end of our conference here from the UK. So um, I'm in a moment gonna hand back to uh, my colleague, Nicole. Um, but just to say that um, our next conference, the date is yet to be confirmed. Actually, the next uh, event is not a conference. It's going to be a workshop. Um, so a number of times in our conversation today, the whole area of training and how we set up training programs uh, is, has come up. And this is a key area that uh, the steering group uh, for the craft of the Miller um, are working hard at. Um, and so we're gonna have a specific workshop where we're going to learn uh, from each other about this key topic. And so what we're looking forward to uh, is being able to share some presentations on this, uh, learn from some of our colleagues who have already developed programs, especially our Dutch colleagues who have a lot of experience with this, and then break into small groups where we can really get into the, the detail uh, and ensure that those of us who are now working on this uh, can really learn from each other and apply this as we start to build uh, these programs. So um, more details will be coming out uh, in the next uh, three to four weeks. Um, so watch this space. Um, and um, that's where we're going to be going next time. So as I say, it's been great to uh, welcome you all to the UK. Thanks once again to those of you who are still on, who are taking part in the presentation and everyone organizing. Thanks to Nicole and Eric, doing a fantastic job uh, uh, bringing together all those questions. I'm going to say thank you, uh, goodbye, and hand back to Nicole. Thank you a lot, John, and also great thanks to you. Great thanks to the technicians here who made this all possible. And I want to stimulate you to, uh, to network with each other, even if there's not a conference like this. But we have the, the gallery yeah, for uh, the participants gallery on the website. You can join there, uh, see other people and see their uh, emails. You can ask questions and get in contact with each other if you have specific things with, which you want to know, of course. Um, as John said, uh, we will uh, uh, be preparing a next workshop conference. Please uh, check uh, the website for the date and we also will email you, of course, if we have the date available. And uh, well, thank you for joining now and I hope to see you all next time. Bye. <laughs>